Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to him. Why do we pay homage to him? Someone said that to me once. We pay homage to him because he was the human being who figured out how to unearth this and uncover the answers that we talk about week to week. He is the one who decided to once and for all go out and spend the time necessary to discover this. Now, in his time, things were quite different. So I'm going to start by taking you to 12, because that is the one everybody really wants to know about. And if you go to chapter 12, uh, to Sutta number 12, this one is going to talk about from section 44 to 64 is actually going to tell you about what he, the Bodhisatta was using for his austerities. Now in the time of the Buddha, so we remember how this works and why was he doing this? He was doing it because it was the only thing they did at that time. And in the history, in, within the religious systems at that time, they firmly, they believed that the only way of actually opening up the mind and finding the truth was by torturing the body. And so different ways were worked with, you see, if you're, if you're in extreme pain, I actually had an experience with this that I could begin to understand it when Bonte was explaining it to me. Before I was involved with Bonte, I had a car accident. In 1979, I was put into a big brace on the body and couldn't move for a while and was in extreme pain. And the way I handled the pain was just deciding to stop fighting the pain. I didn't have any training at that time. But one thing that I did experience during the time that I was going through all that tremendous amount of pain, and I didn't want to take the pain uh, medications that were addictive. I didn't want to do it. And so I fought through this thing. But I learned that if I was going into the pain and only the pain was there and nothing else, that a lot of things that went on in my brain stopped going on. Because I, and this is what they knew. They knew that if there was pain, inflicted enough pain, that that would be the only thing. If you look, if you drew a picture of the brain and you had a hundred lines coming out from the head, you know, sticking out all different ways like this, and they were going to your different organs and handling the different things that the brain is in charge of all the organs in your body. It's a busy bee. It's a real busy bee. It's the control center for your whole for your whole life and your whole body. And it stops. It just simply stops because you have injured your spine and injured your neck in a really bad way. So all this pain is there. And if you don't know what to do with it, one thing is the tendency to just go to that pain. That's unfortunate because of what we know about the hindrances now, isn't it? Because it made the pain tremendously bad. But I didn't pass out. However, one thing I did notice about that experience was that was all that was there. There was no thought about the kids, about the business, about the cars, about the trucks, about the house, about anything, anywhere. There was only that. With this information, they pushed forward to try a lot of things. So let's dive into this. And 44, it tells us, this is the chapter, uh, uh, it's the Maha, uh, Maha Siyanada Sutta, number 12 in the Majima Nikaya. It's on page 173, and it starts the Bodhisattva's austerities section. He's going to talk to Sariputta about what he did. I recall living a holy life, possessing four factors. I have been an ascetic, a supreme ascetic. I have been coarse supremely coarse. I have been scrupulous, supremely scrupulous. 
I have been secluded, supremely secluded. Such was my asceticism, Sariputta, that I went naked, rejecting conventions, licking my hands, not coming when I was asked, not stopping when asked. I did not accept food brought or food specially made or any invitation to a meal. I received nothing from a pot, from a bowl, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, from any pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food was advertised to be distributed, from where a dog was waiting, from where flies were buzzing, I accepted no fish or meat. I drank no liquor, wine, or fermented brew. I kept to one house, one morsel. I kept to two houses, two morsels. I kept to three houses, three morsels. To four houses, four morsels. To five houses, five morsels. To six houses, six morsels and to seven houses, seven morsels. I lived on one saucer full a day or two saucer full a days on to seven saucer fulls a day. I took food once a day, once every two days, three, four, five, six or seven days. Thus, even up to once every fortnight, I dwelt pursuing the practice of taking food at stating, stated intervals. I was an eater of greens, or that means grass and everything, or millet, that means the wheat on the vine, on the stick, or wild rice, or hide pairings, or uh, that's when you butchered the animal, the parings of the skin, you could take the skin and chew it for energy. And moss off of the rocks in the forest, or rice bran, or rice scum, or sea scum, or sesame flour, or grass, or cow dung. And the cow dung, I asked Bonte about this, what he's talking about is he would go where the babies where the baby calves were born. And when they're first born, uh, the dung that comes from the um, newborn calf is very, very high in protein. And you can eat the cow dung from the baby calf and you can survive. I lived on forest roots and fruits. I fed on fallen fruits. I clothed myself in hemp in hemp mixed cloth, try it sometime, it's not comfortable. <laughs> in shrouds, these were the, and in refuse rags, these are the garbage rags, the shrouds, they went to the uh, burning places where they cremated the bodies and the poor people left the bodies and they were wrapped in cloth, whatever they had. They took the cloth off of those bodies when they were rotting away really badly. And um, then they washed them in the river and tried to stitch them together to have enough cloth to make their robes. In, a, in tree bark, there was a famous monk who was known for his tree bark robe. He stitched the bark of some of the trees, wide pieces like this square together and made it enough that he could cover himself. In hemped mixed cloth, in the shrouds and refuse rags, okay, tree bark, in antelope hide, um, which is really coarse. I saw some of that and it's really tough. And strips of antelope hide in kusa grass fabric. Now this is really cruel because kusa grass uh, can slice your hand. It's a big grass that grows almost as tall as I am in a field if it's not cut gets very tough and if you take your hand across across it you can slice your finger open in bark fabric in wood shavings fabric in head hair wool where he would collect the wool where people's hair was cut and try to weave it together to make thread 
in animals' wool, in owls' wings. I was one who pulled out hair and beard, pursuing the practice of pulling out hair and beard. I was one who stood continuously rejecting any seats, which is still today an accepted dutanga or practice that the monks can use if they chose to try it for a while, but it's really, you have to be really strong and really fit to do this because you cannot sit at all ever or lie down. Everything is standing up. You can stand up and lean against a wall in order to sleep. I was one who squatted continuously devoted to maintaining the squatting position. I was one who used a mattress of spikes. This is one many of us have seen pictures of, and I have seen people doing this in the Hindu temples who still believe this, that that's one of the things you can do to open your mind. I made a mattress of spikes for my bed. I dwelt pursuing the practice of bathing in water three times daily, including the evening. And thus, in such a variety of ways, I dwelt pursuing the practice of tormenting and mortifying my body. And such was my asceticism, such was my coarseness, Sariputta, that just as the bowl of the Tinduka tree accumulating over the years cakes and flakes off, so too dust and dirt accumulated over the years and caked off my body and flaked off of it. It never occurred to me, oh, let me rub this dust and dirt off of with my hand or let another rub this dust and dirt off with, my, with their hand. It never occurred to me thus, such was my coarseness. I didn't think people could survive like this. I never thought of it. And I was working at a soup kitchen in Washington, DC that is called Some, So Others May Eat. It's a Catholic organization. And in that place, it, we served meals um, seven days a week and I worked on weekends to let people off with my daughter. I, we served there for a while. And once the manager brought this man and he said, you can't come in. And I said, why can't he come in? He says, because we have to bathe him first. And uh, I said, what do you mean? And he said, I'll explain it to you afterwards. They took him away, they took his clothes, they burned his clothes, they scrubbed him and they took the worms out of his back. He had not cleansed himself or bathed himself for months and months. This is what can happen to you. These things, little, they're like mites and worms will go into the, the, the skin as the skin dries out and the little holes in your skin expand and lets these things go into the skin and then they can house there and turn into these little worms. It was dreadful. It was really torturous to see this man's back. And um, then they gave him new clothes and everything. And then they took him in and they fed him. And then of course he went back to that life again out there in the city. Such was my scrupulousness, Sariputta, that I was always mindful in stepping forwards and backwards and stepping backwards. And I was full of pity even in regards to a drop of water and thus let me not hurt the tiny creatures in the crevices of the ground. Such was my scrupulousness. Such was my seclusion, Sariputta. I was, I would plunge into the forest and dwell there. And when I saw a cowherd or a shepherd or someone gathering grass or sticks or a woodsman, I would flee from the grove to grove, from thicket to thicket, from hollow to hollow, from hillock to hillock. And why was that? So that they should not see me and I see them just as a forest bred deer on seeing human beings flees from grove to grove, from thicket to thicket, from hollow to hollow, from hillock to hillock. So too, when I saw a cowherd or shepherd, I did so. Such was my seclusion. I would go on all fours, all fours to the cow pens when the cattle had gone out and the cowherd had left them. I would feed on the dung of the young suckling calves. This is what Ponte explained to me. And as long as my own excrement and urine lasted, I fed on my own excrement and urine. 
Such was my great practice of feeding on filth. And yet we still know today one of the solutions for the uh, recluses, for the heavy ascetics, is to take their own urine and then sit it in the sun for a period of time and then drink it with water, mixed with water to cure and cleanse out the body. And it saves them from dying. We still know that that works in Ayurvedic practices. I would plunge into some awe-inspiring grove and dwell there, <clears throat> a grove so awe-inspiring that it would make worst, uh, make most of man's hairs to stand up uh, if he were not freed from his lust. When those cold wintry nights came during the 80 days period of snowfall, I would dwell by night in the open and by day in the grove. And in the last month of the hot season, I would dwell by day in the open and by night in the grove. And there came to me spontaneously a stanza that was never heard before. Chilled by night and scorched by day, alone in awe-inspiring groves, naked, no fire to sit beside, the sage yet pursues his quest. And I would make my bed in a charnel ground with the bones of the dead for a pillow. And cowherd boys came up and spat on me and urinated on me and threw dirt at me and poked sticks into my ears. And yet I do not recall I ever aroused an evil mind of hate against them. Such was my abiding in equanimity. Sariputta, there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine, doctrinal view is this. Purification comes about through food. And they say, let us live on cola fruits. And they eat the cola fruits and they eat the cola fruit powder and they drink the cola fruit water and they make many kinds of cola fruit concoctions. But I recall having eaten a single uh, uh, cola fruit a day, only one. Sariputta, you may think that the cola fruit was bigger at that time, and yet you should not regard it so. The cola fruit was then at most the same size as now. Through the feeding on a single cola fruit a day, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. Because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jointed segments of vines on bamboo stems. And because of eating so little, my backside became just like a camel's hoof, really rough. Because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like beaded cord, corded beads. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. Because of eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank far down in their sockets, looking like a gleam of water that has sunk far down into a deep well. And because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and the sun. And because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. Thus, if I wanted to touch my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. And if I wanted to touch my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. And because of eating so little, if I wanted to defecate or urinate, I fell over on my face right there. Because of eating so little, if I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots and fell from my body as I rubbed. Sariputta, there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this, purification comes about through food. They say, let us live on beans, let us live on sesame, let us live on rice, let us eat rice, and they'll eat rice powder and drink the rice water and make all kinds of concoctions. But I recall having eaten a single rice grain a day. 
Sariputta, you may think that the rice grain was bigger at the time, but you should not regard it so because the rice grain then at most was the same size as it is now. Through feeding on a single rice grain a day, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation because of eating so little, the hair rotted at its roots and fell out of my body as I rubbed and I shredded at my skin. Sariputta, yet by such conduct, by such practice, by such performance of austerities, I did not attain any superhuman states or any distinction in knowledge and vision that was worthy of noble ones. That's the key line here. This is what he was trying to get across to his monks. And yet still today, we will see monks come in, put their robes on and almost die from trying to do these kinds of austerities. Why? Why would we do that when the master has given us the path and the instructions and they work if we follow them precisely from the text very, very closely? Why? It's a mystery to me. Why was that? Because I did not attain the noble wisdom, which when attained is noble and emaciating and leads to the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering doesn't happen. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine view purification comes through the round of rebirths, but it is not easy to find a realm in the round that I have not already passed through in this long journey, except for the gods of the pure abodes. And had I passed through the round as a god in the pure abodes, I would never have returned to this world again. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine is view is this. Purification comes about through some kind of particular rebirth, but it is not to find a kind of rebirth that I have not been born in already on this long journey, except for the gods of the pure abodes. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view in this purification comes about through some particular abode, but it is not to find a kind of abode that I have not already dwelt in except for the gods of the pure abodes. There are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrines and view is this purification comes about through sacrifice, but it is not easy to find a kind of sacrifice that has not already been offered up by me on this long journey when I was either head anointed noble king or well-to-do Brahmin. And there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this purification comes through fire worship, but it is not easy to find a kind of fire that has not already been worshipped by me on this long journey when I was either a head anointed king or a well-to-do Brahmin. Sariputta, there are certain recluses and Brahmins whose doctrine and view is this, as long as this good man is still young, a black haired young man endowed with the blessings of youth and in the prime of life, so long is he perfect in his lucid wisdom. But when this good man is old, aged, and burdened with years advanced in life and come to the last stage, being 80 or 90 or 100 years old, then the lucidity of his wisdom is lost. But it should not be regarded so. I am now old, aged, and burdened with years, advanced in life, and I come to the last stage. My years have turned to 80. So this is near the end of his life when this is happening. He's talking to Sariputta. Now suppose that I had four disciples with a hundred years lifespan, perfect in mindfulness, retentiveness, memory, and lucidity of wisdom. Just as a skilled archer, trained and practiced and tested, could easily shoot a light arrow across the shadow of a palm tree, 
suppose that they were even to that extent perfect in their mindfulness and retentiveness and memory and lucidity of wisdom. Suppose that they continuously asked me about the four foundations of mindfulness and that I answered them when asked and that they remembered each answer of mine and never asked me a subsidiary question or paused except to eat and drink and consume food, taste, urinate, defecate, and rest in order to remove sleepiness and tiredness. Still the Tathagata's exposition of the Dhamma, his explanations of factors of the Dhamma, so his replies to questions would not yet come to an end. But meanwhile, those four disciples of mine with their hundred years lifespan would have died at the end of those hundred years. Sariputta, even if you have to carry me about on a bed, still there will be no change in the lucidity of the Tathagata's wisdom to the day he dies, he's saying. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many, out of compassion for the world and for good welfare and happiness of gods and humans. It is of me indeed that rightly speaking, this should be said. Now on that occasion, the venerable Nagasamala was standing behind the Blessed One, fanning him. And then he said to the Blessed One, it is wonderful, venerable sir, it is marvelous. As I listened to this discourse on the Dhamma, the hairs of my body stood up. Oh, venerable sir, what is the name of the discourse on the Dhamma? And as to that, Nagasamali, you may remember this discourse on the Dhamma as called the hair raising discourse. That's where it got its name from. So these were the kinds of austerities that he was practicing over the six years on his journey, always heading forward with the question of their suffering and wanting to understand the precisely what the suffering was, how did it work, what is the cause of the suffering, wanting to understand precisely how that worked. That's why he grasped the study of human cognition so completely independent origination. When he wanted to understand their cessation and saw that people could be without suffering for periods of time, he saw that the common man could have a way for relief of suffering as well and this is where the right effort comes in that we teach you. But understanding right effort is so important because it was so simple and it got lost so easily. Why did it get lost? Just because of the word effort. <laughs> the different, different times that people live in the different seriousness of competition between being the best and the mightiest and the most successful and the richest and the most powerful and everything and the effort we put in that kind of way was not the right effort. Effort is true. You have to keep going and persevere and keep doing, but keep doing what? The steps of right effort were very clear and very clearly lost. The four steps of right effort appear five times very clearly or six times in the Majima Nikaya. And right striving and right effort are the same thing, the same paragraph. Recognize when there is an unwholesome mind state in your mind. The second step is to release that unwholesome mind, that unwholesome mind state. Just let go of your attention off of it and relax your head, relax your mind. Okay, relax means to tranquilize. It doesn't mean go to sleep. You know, I had somebody say, don't tell people to relax. They won't get anything done. I'm there. If you tell someone to stay stressed out, they can't sew, they can't write, they can't think, and they can't produce a good profit line for you either. They have to be able to be relaxed and clear and bright in their mind to be able to do their work properly, to teach properly, to help properly with anything. So this is the mistake of saying relax has to mean only one thing. How'd that happen? 
you know, I over the years I got to teach English in Asia and I noticed something was happening. If I told them I wanted them to find the meaning of a set of words, I noticed they did something that I used to do in Spanish class. And that was, I looked up in the dictionary what a word was, and I took the first definition, closed the book, and went to the class to have the quiz. But there were four or five or six definitions, and you never looked at them. You see? If you start looking at the definitions of word, you're going to find out there are different ways a word is defined. And some of the words we use in the meditation are like this. So effort is one of them. We don't take away that you should sit every day, a couple hours at least. We don't take away uh, that when you sit, how you should be sitting and you should make an effort to do things the right way, have the right posture, follow the instructions. These are the efforts we want you to do. Follow the steps precisely. So you recognize this unwholesome, you let go of it and you relax you smile and come back to what you were doing. When you smile, why do you smile? Am I telling you, you have to be happy all the time? No, I'm not telling you have to be happy all the time. I'm telling you that these muscles right here are connected to a muscle that goes up here into the head that relaxes these two parts of your brain. And when they relax and tra tra get tranquilized and relax a tiny bit and are not pressing against each other anymore, something inside is called the pineal gland. And something happens with the pineal gland, you need to have it happen. Trust me, it's fun. Because <laughs> when the pineal gland releases dopamine, or releases the other types of endorphins that are there, you see, that's how uplifted joy happens and you feel happy. That's how first jhana marker happens. That's how your mind starts to open a little bit and you experience something different. You experience, you don't have to be like this at work all day and concentrating really hard, that you can relax and smile and remember that you came to work, you're here for the period of work, and guess what? You leave work. And that, my friend, is experiencing a Nietzsche every day, the impermanence of having to come to work, the impermanence of having to work with the worst piano student in the world who won't follow instructions, but pays the bill every month. And her mother wants her to learn how to do the piano anyway. But you're going to have the beginning of that piano class, May, and you're going to have the middle of it and the end every time. <laughs> I remember teaching voice and teaching singing, you know, and working with microphones for in concerts and stuff and having people absolutely not follow my instructions and pay me a lot of money to teach them. And I would just smile and keep trying to teach them. And you could record how I was teaching them and how they were ignoring it and how they were failing again and again. So effort to follow instructions and keep the four steps of effort working all the time. Why? Because when something arises that it pulls you away, the hindrance should be what? Should be abandoned. Okay, now here's the knowledge. Why should it just be abandoned instead of crushed and annihilated and eradicated and subdued and suppressed? Why? Ah, because one of the pieces of knowledge we're trying to show you is that the hindrance has a kind of nutriment. And this is coming from the text directly. In many places, it's showing you where the hindrance has nutriment. What is the nutriment for a hindrance? My personal attention to it. When I was paying attention to the pain that time when in the accident, I could keep myself, uh, it was just something to do, but I could pass out just thinking about one thing and staying on track with that, you see? That was a one-pointed effort. I had no training at all. It was just something to do to keep me from just collapsing and going unconscious. But now we know that if I had not paid attention to the pain, if I had been paying attention to something else other than the pain, I would have taken away 
the nutriment from the pain getting more and more and more severe. Now we know that if we teach someone who is terminally ill with bone cancer, we know if we were having them to just play asteroids on the computer for a little while, they wouldn't push the button to get more morphine again and again and again. They would take far less. Why? because the pain is still happening when the person is wired up. The person is still having the pain arise, exist and pass away, but they're not paying attention to it anymore. And so then they, it isn't as severe. Now we know all of this is documented. We don't have to argue with the text anymore because the neuroscience and the neurocognitive, uh, cognitive psychology and neurocognitive research have proven all of this. So why are we still arguing? Beats me, I'm not sure, <laughs> okay? But when something comes up, you will reach for it out of habitual, habitual, just habits, it's habitual. And when you reach for it, you just notice you're grabbing hold of it. You let go of it, relax, smile and come back. And then you have concluded two things. The first two steps was recognizing the unwholesome and letting go of it. Okay, and that was the purification of your mind. You're, you are purifying your mind when you practice right effort properly. The last two steps are when you smile by bringing up a wholesome in place of it and keeping the wholesome going and continuing it and having more wholesome feelings happening and you're teaching your brain and this is what they tell you is happening in cognitive psychology with how to change a habit from an old habit to a new habit, all you have to do to train your brain to do that automatically. My students are doing it automatically. They're calling me and saying after a couple of months of following the instructions that automatically their brain is letting go, relaxing, smiling, coming back, and they keep going. And what's happening for them? They move from 30 minutes of sitting to two hours to three hours of sitting. How did they do that? They never thought they would be able to do that. And they do that in a retreat time. How can they do that in 10 days? Because we went back and we said, let's just pretend we don't know anything. This is what the toughest thing for all of us is. Let's pretend we have an empty cup with no information and we're just going to do what the Buddha tells us to do on the Eightfold Path. But we're going to look at it in an operational manner. We're not going to, for instance, take the eight pieces of the Eightfold Path and say, well, these three were wisdom and these three for this and these two are left or the, this sort of thing. We're not going to do that. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's because they called it an eightfold path. They didn't call it an eight piece or an eight step path, did they? And you go back to the translation and you can't get away from it. It's an eightfold path. And what is folded? What is folded? Well, a fan is folded and it has eight pieces on it. And if it's this wide and I fan myself, I can cool myself. If I take three of those and say, well, that's the sila, now I only have five. Well, that's making life harder for me to fan myself and cool myself off. Six, seven, and eight of the Eightfold Path. That's your practice guidelines, right? Right effort, mindfulness, concentration. What is mindfulness? Let's get away from, we don't know what mindfulness is and all this stuff. Let's just say for the sake of it, Mindfulness is a form of observation. Meditation is the tool he was using to see closely how everything worked. It's what he was trying to understand. In the beginning, he had to do all these forceful things. Now let's go somewhere else and see something else in the text for a minute. Go to, um, let's see, where do I want you to go? 32 section seven. 32 section seven is going to be on 309, page 309 of your book. In section seven, it says, Sariputta addressed Mahakasapa thus, friend Kasapa, the venerable Anuruddha has spoken according to his inspiration. Now this one is about the Maha Gosinga Sutta. And the question comes to four different monks 
which monk is the best monk to, to light up the Gosinga Sala wood grove to cause the light to shine. And the idea was that when the people are minds are open, they're shining. I know that sounds funny. I'll tell you it's true, but you don't have to believe me. One day you'll figure it out for yourself. <laughs> but it really is true. And I showed up three days late to a retreat when I only had four days to attend where Bonte was teaching in Florida once and walked in and they were already working four days into this thing, I think. It was a nine day retreat and they were shining. <laughs> And I'm there, what's going on with these people? They're all walking around with uplifted, open, you know, bright faces and they're shining. What's going on? He said, just get started. And I started, I began to understand. We asked the Venerable Kasapa now, Venerable Kasapa. Uh, let's see, we have to go. Um, mm -hmm. The Gosinga Solitary Woodgrove is delightful. Let's see, I have to get to the beginning here. The night is moonlight. The solid trees are all in blossom. The heavenly scents seem to be floating in the air. What kind of monk, friend Kasapa, what kind of monk could illuminate this Gosinga Sala Woodgrove? Here, friend Sariputta, a monk is a forest dweller himself and speaks in praise of the forest dwelling. He's an alms food eater himself and speaks in praise of eating alms food. He's a refuse wearer and he himself and he speaks in praise of wearing refuse rag robes. He is a triple robe wearer and himself and speaks in praise of wearing the triple robe. He has a few wishes himself and speaks in praise of fewness of wishes. He's content himself and speaks in praise of contentment. He is secluded himself and speaks in praise of seclusion. He is aloof from society himself and speaks praise in aloofness of society. He's energetic himself and he speaks in praise of arousing his energy each day to keep practicing. He is attained in virtue, keeps his virtue and uh, his uh, precepts himself and speaks in praise of attainment of virtue. And he has attained in his level of productive concentration himself uh, and speaks in praise of attaining the proper level of concentration. He has attained a wisdom himself and speaks in praise of the uh, the attainment of his wisdom, and he has attained deliverance himself and speaks in praise of the attainment of deliverance. And he has attained to the knowledge uh, and vision of deliverance himself and speaks in praise uh, and attainment and knowledge and vision of deliverance. That's the kind of bhikkhu who would illuminate the Gosinga Sala Grove. And when that was said, Sariputta addressed him and said, um, you know, has spoken this, then he questioned Mahamogalana later. Okay, so what I chose this section because I many of the things you heard about before are here, but only the lighter ascetic practices. And so there is a collection um, on 32.7. What we're hearing about are the 13 Dutangas. And these Dutanga practices, a monk might choose while he is a monk to practice for six months or a year and, and practice. And Bhante practiced one, um, I think it was the standing one, for six months where he attempted to only stand. So in standing, you sleep, in standing, you eat, in standing, you walk, in standing, you listen to everything. You may not sit at all. And he did it for a period of months, I know. And uh, then, you know, we have another one. We talk about the bowl. I did the bowl for, for uh, Bombs Bowl for three months. 
and lived on the bowl, com completely on the bowl. So I took no other food anywhere and went out every day in the community when I was in Sri Lanka and gathered my food and brought it back to where I was staying and kept a, the did a blessing on the food. And then I had my breakfast and a portion came with me to school to the, to the college and I ate with the other monks and nuns there for the lunch. So this is living on your bowl, and that's one of the Dutangas. And then he also spoke of the various ones in there. You can go back and look through them. The triple robe is another we respect, where we only keep three robes at a time, okay? And so we would keep those three robes for a time. And at first I kept the three robes for over a year or two. And then people started giving me robes. And then people started asking me to please be a different color. People can hear you if you're orange. That was one of my favorite times. I was purple and they wanted me to be orange and I could teach on TV only if I was orange. I liked that and they got me an orange robe. Now, the punishment for changing colors was I tried it on and I went out in the lobby and the teachers came out at the college and they all congratulated me on how beautiful I looked in this orange robe. And it felt like I had finally bought the right prom dress. <laughs> And then I, I looked at that and started laughing and I thought, that's funny. And then I kept it on and I walked down to the house to go back in my house, carrying the other one with me. When I went through the gate and went near the door, the front door, the owner was home in the house, you know, and I uh, was not on the, going to knock on the door. But then I started going like this, you know, and she opens the door, she says, what's wrong? I said, the bees are attacking me. <laughs> Because the bees had never seen anybody in this house to wear this bright orange color that these monks were. <laughs> so I felt punished for changing, but I kept the robe and used it in uh, Colombo and taught half hour programs on uh, one of the TV stations for a time. And uh, it was very funny because I thought, why is it that they can't hear me? They cannot hear me uh, if I'm purple. <laughs> How does that affect your your ears? <laughs> so anyway, that was the story of the color. So here you see that the, the Dutangas are here. So the practices are still here. Uh, the forest dwelling, the alms eater, the refuse wearer, the triple robe wearer, uh, the fewness of wishes, the seclusion, living in seclusion away from people is another one that we did and then remains aloof from society completely and energetic uh, and, um, and building up energy and then virtue and then the concentration, uh, keeping uh, your concentration balanced and then wisdom deliverance and knowledge and vision of of the of the knowledge learning through knowledge and vision and this this uh, this approach of knowledge and vision was a big thing for the buddha you have to understand if you're not in india you don't get experience with this the guru says this and no questions and you go home and you're supposed to be learning that way and in america the brahmin teenagers are still learning that way i questioned them in new york and that's exactly the same method it was a thousand years ago. You, you listen to what we say, you recite the verses and that's it. There's no questions. But the Buddha demanded certain things in his meditation training school. He demanded that you do not accept something or believe it unless you see it for yourself. And the only way to actually build knowledge and wisdom was to establish your foundation stone. And the foundation stone, you had to agree, you would work to see it in order to believe it. So this is knowledge and vision. And then comes knowledge and wisdom. That's how this was working. Okay, now we go to uh, 36. Um, 36 is special. 36 is where we get to see uh, the moment when he actually changes everything 
in his practice. It's the moment when he is telling them about the moment that he decides to change his approach to everything, which is backing us up when we're saying that we don't do this kind of aesthetic stuff, ascetic stuff where it's torturing the body anymore. He decides it's all a waste of time. So in this sutta, basically this is happening with Sachika. Sachika shows up and Sachika is from the Nagantha's son. Nagantha was one of the teachers at the time and he was one of the Nagantha's sons, a follower. And Sachika comes and question, went up to the Buddha, engages him in a discussion. And he's being, he says in the beginning that he, even though you are, um, he says, basically, um, even though you're being rude and um, indignant to me, you know, treating me without respect, the Buddha says, I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> okay. And at that point, he goes into a huge sutta here. Uh, but um, the first he listens in the beginning, he listens to uh, Sachika explain all the things like we described, all the things that people were doing and denying themselves food and all this stuff. And even though he, he each time he describes one of the practices to the Buddha uh, that is a kind of torturous practice, um, the Buddha says back to him, and did it work for them? Did they have noble, did they have these uh, noble experiences? And the, the uh, Sachika admits, no, no, they didn't, you know, and did they survive eating that way? And no, actually they didn't. And did this and the, he keeps asking him. And then finally, uh, he says to him, um, surely your words are offensive to me and discourteous. I'm at section 10 on 335. But still I will answer you, since I shaved off my head and beard and put on a yellow robe and I went forth from the home life to the homelessness, it has not been possible for a risen pleasant feeling to invade my mind and take over completely and remain, or for a risen painful feeling to invade my mind and remain forever. You know, and then he says, has there never arisen in Master Godam, and this is his last question, has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade his mind and remain? Has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so painful that it could invade his mind and it and it would remain? All right. So it's questioning about Anicca. This is questioning about uh, challenging Anicca in a way. So now we start and I'm just going to keep reading here. Why not? Uh, I will answer you. Why not Ajivasana? Here before my enlightenment, now he starts the whole story. While I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide and open. It is not easy while living at home to lead the holy life that's utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. So suppose I shave off my hair and beard and I put on a yellow robe and I go forth the home life into homelessness. And later, while still young, he goes in the prime of his life. And we go to 26, section 14. Let's see if we can do that one. To 17, 14 to 17. Okay, if I had that one marked. Um, Having gone forth in search of what is wholesome, seeking the super mundane and sublime peace, I went to Alara Kalama. So this is, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I talked to Alara Kalama and he gives the account here of Alara Kalama as one of the prime teachers in his time. Alara Kalama and Ramaputta, they're the best teachers out there. So he goes to Alara Kalama and decides to turn himself over to Alara Kalama. And he goes through his training and he gets as far as, uh, as um, nothingness, right? That's right, he gets as far as nothingness. He declares the base of nothingness. In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. And then I considered not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, but I too have the same thing he has. And Alara Kalama offers him half of the community. And you can 
you can stay with me and teach half of the community. So now he's up to nothingness. This is where he is. And then he decides, but I soon quickly, uh, he, he realized that there was more. And there is true. I wondered how that worked until I started practicing with Bonte. And as you're practicing, you have this thing inside, you know, there's more, you know, there's more, you know, there's more until you go through finally the first time. And then you realize, okay, you can go through again and go through again and go through again. But you, but you can, uh, that this path, the way it's structured gives you this feeling, but there's more, there's more. And we see that a lot in the suttas. So what happened here was after Alara Kalama's training, to, as far as nothingness, he then goes over to Ramaputta. And when he goes over to, to Ramaputta, he goes to the same thing with Ramaputta. And this family, funny thing that says, uh, you know, we all joked about this one about Rama and the Dhamma. <laughs> so I'll read it to you. By realizing for myself by direct knowledge that I enter upon and abide in the Dhamma, certainly Rama abided knowing and seeing the Dhamma. And then I went to Dhaka Rupa, Ramaputta and asked him, in, in what way did Rama declare by realizing for himself? with direct knowledge that he entered upon and abided in the Dhamma. And Udaka Ramaputta, he declares the base of neither perception or non-perception. The Buddha reaches that level. And then at the end of this conversation, if I can find it, um, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, so the Dhamma that Rama declared, he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in, realizing for yourself the direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon is the same as Rama declared he entered upon, realizing for himself. And so, um, so the let, so let's see the last sentences. So you know the Dhamma that Rama knew, and Rama knew the Dhamma that you know. As Rama was, so are you, and as you are, so was Rama. We all start giggling every time Bhante used to read this because it's a tongue tie. You know, Rama and the Dhamma and the Dhamma and Rama and you. <laughs> and you you can experience the same way to get to this level and experience this place. I guess it's sort of stuck in it for a while, is what happened for a while to, until you understand how to let go and just be and just watch and then you get past that into cessation. So that's what's what's happening there. And so this is what he explains. Now jump over in uh, back from 26. We leave this and we come back over after he does what Rama did and he still has more to go and he considers um, he finds a place where he's going to sit in the end of Rama's story, two, page 259. This is an agreeable piece of ground. This is delightful, a grove of clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks. Nearby, there's a village for alms resort, and this will serve for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. I sat down there and this will serve for my striving. Now we know where he's at. He's at Bodh Gaya and he's going to sit beside uh, the river, and that's what he's going to put himself to. Now, okay, um, in we go back to 36, and what happens in 36 now is a description from there. He starts to have, he has these, uh, these um, similes that he sees about the sappy water and the wet water and, and the damp water and how you have to have the pure pure way of doing this in order to get through and succeed. He sees that, okay? And then what happens when you turn the page onto 336, he's telling him about this, uh, these three similes. And then what happens is he starts to talk about how he was handling, uh, what he talking, he's talking, remember he's talking in the beginning to, to Sariputta and to, to Satchika, and, and he's going to be talking to the monks. And when he's teaching the monks about this whole thing, how this happened, and this is being repeated, this sutta, he, he is attempting to show them what they should not bother doing anymore in their practice. So this is where you get to 337. 
in, the, in those days, he's telling them what happened when he starts to treat the hindrances certain ways, what happens to him and why you begin to understand why you shouldn't be fighting with them at all, that you can destroy them and, and annihilate them and get rid of them by understanding how they work instead. This is a critical piece of what's missing today in training. So it's something to investigate. Don't believe me, you have to investigate when I'm telling you always, and you need to try it out before you say anything about whether you think it's right or wrong. Don't think I'm right, think it works or not. That's what I'm interested in. So when he finishes that, he says, now I thought, suppose this is if there is a, 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 a some type of um, hindrance comes up so at 20 and 337, I thought, suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against, against the roof of my mouth, I should beat down, constrain, crush mind with mind. Now we've heard this before in, in Sutta number 20, that this was a possible way that you could handle your, your uh, hindrances. And we consider in our teaching, we consider 20 as a mistake. <laughs> then anybody can consider it a mistake or not. Nobody says we can't. And so the monks have done this over the centuries and shifted things around. But in 20 appears in the Majima Nikaya as a way of handling the hindrances in the first three parts of, of Sutta number 20, first two parts are reasonable, but the third part and fourth way of handling hindrances gets to being ridiculous. Why am I saying that? Because in the text itself, you cannot find this paragraph that I'm going to read for you. You cannot find any support for it out of 152 suttas just in the Majima Nikaya. And you go to the Samyutta Nikaya, you absolutely cannot find any support to do the following if you have a hindrance. You have to go to the sections of the suttas that explain the nutriment of a hindrance and the food for it and what you should do about it. In those lessons are in the Majima Nikaya and in the Samyutta Nikaya, especially the Samyutta Nikaya. In the Bojanga Samyutta, it gives you strict instructions that the seven enlightenment factors are never going to come up for you and get balanced unless you your hindrances are completely gone. And it tells you if you give any careless attention to any of the five hindrances, that cover all of the hindrances, really, um, then you are feeding those hindrances and they will not leave. And if they do not leave, the seven enlightenment factors cannot come up and they cannot become balanced. If that's true, you cannot get through neither perception or non-perception out the other side and fall into cessation. To Neuroda, you cannot experience Neuroda. So this all boils down to how functionally do I need to do this? And so listen to what happens. And he tells them in this sutta, don't ever do what was mentioned in, in sutta number 20. And it's the same paragraph. Suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I were to beat down and constrain and crush mind with mind. Now that does not sound easy, does it? <laughs> Okay, so with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down and constrained and crushed mind with mine. And while I did so, sweat ran from my armpits, just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head and shoulders and beat him down, constrain him, crush him. So too, with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down and constrained and crushed mine with mine till sweat ran from my armpits. And but although tight, here it is. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body became overwrought and uncalm because I had exhausted, I was exhausted by painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain because even that is affected by Anicca. No matter what he did, it was going to pass away, you see? And he's, this is happening in an area where he's telling you about doing that kind of heavy thing 
it doesn't work. Now he, he says, so I thought, suppose I practice breathingless meditation. I'll try that, breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose. And when I did so, there was a loud sound of wind coming out from my ear holes, just as there is a loud sound when the smith's bellows are blown. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my nose and ears, there was a loud sound sound of winds coming out from my ear holes. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain. So he passed away that. But then he said, suppose I practice furtherless, further, into the breathingless meditation. Let's go farther in. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. And while I did so, <clears throat> violent winds cut through my head, just as a strong man were to crush my head with the tip of a sharp sword. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, violent winds would cut through my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted. And I became painful by the painful striving. So it must be he's striving the wrong way, he's thinking. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. Well, I thought. Suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. Boy, he's gung ho. <laughs> so I stopped the in breaths and out breaths through pains in my uh, through my mouth, nose, and ears. And while I did so, there were violent pains in my head, just as the strong man were tightening a leather strap around my head. As a headband, so too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose and ears, there were violent pains in my head. But again, although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, he kept watching. My mind was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the strainful, painful striving. But such painful striving that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So now he's going to continue again. Now, at this point is where he's holding breath. This is where he's holding breath, but it gets worse. You'll see. Suppose I practice further this breathingless meditation. So I stop the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. And while I did so, violent winds carved up my belly now, just as a skilled butcher and his apprentice were to carve up the ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. So too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. Violent winds carved up my belly, but although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was still overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. And this, but the painful feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain. As soon as he stopped what he was doing and let go, it passes. And then now he's still going to do it again. And when he does it here is when Bonte said he thought probably at this point, he, um, he had cut the uvula. And so this means the, the narrow, there's a thin piece of skin. If I go like that, right here. And if you cut that, snip it, it'll fall back in your throat and it can choke you. But if you're uh, able you to, you're trained in this, you swallow your tongue, and then you continue to see if you can get enough oxygen through the, the body, just the outside body function can keep you alive if you're totally and completely calm. And so this is what he was doing at that point. I practiced further the breathingless meditation. I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. And when I did so, there was a violent burning in my body. So we see the three things that are happening is ba basically the headache and then the burning in the belly. And then now he has 
uh, a burning throughout the whole entire body, just as two men were to seize a weaker man with both arms and roast him over a pit, his fever is going up in the heat in his body with hot coals. While I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, there were violent burning in my body, but the tireless energy aroused unremitting mindfulness was established, but my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. And the painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my head and remain. So he's, he's constantly pointing out, a Nietzsche is functioning. It's always functioning to what happened, what you do to yourself is temporary and passes away every single time. Now, when the deities saw me, and this is the little conversation between the devas, you know, some said the recluse Godama is dead. And other deities said the recluse Godama is not dead, he is dying. And the other de the deities said the recluse Godama is not dead or dying, he is an arahat, for such is the way of arahats that they abide. <laughs> and one then I thought, suppose I practice entirely cutting off my food, and now he attempts to starve himself. And at this point, when he's starving himself, he gets to be in as bad situation. I'm not going to go through this part, but he gets to as bad a situation as he did before with the skeleton. Um, to, and the description is absolutely the same as we heard in the other description of how bad it got where you could reach, touch your stomach, you know, here and push through completely to touch the uh the backbone because the organs had shriveled, they were still functional, but it had shriveled and made space so you could do that. And the one person who can do that is the woman who has the baby and you can experience what he experienced after the baby comes out. Because after the baby comes out, your, your organs are over here and the baby's not there. And you can put your hand on your stomach and feel your backbone. It's quite interesting, <laughs> it really is true, okay. So then he goes through all the things of the of the uh, the uh, food and everything, and then what happens is the deities they come back, and um, they tell him that you cannot die, and they say we will not allow you to die, and um, when he says uh, he says you have to let me die. And they say, no, you are the Buddha and you are not going to die. So they're feeding him having, they're feeding him manta, you know, what we say, the heavenly foods. They're feeding him the from the realms, they're feeding him food. So he won't die when he's trying to starve himself from the food. And then we go over to uh, section 30, and he he does something really great here in 30, 31, and 32, and you listen carefully to it. I thought whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to such exertion that this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins at present will experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. But this, by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision that is worthy of noble ones. He makes this declaration and he's making this so the monks learn this is, don't do this stuff. It wasn't worth it. It didn't pay off. You don't have to do this because of course we know and once he goes through, he spends time for 45 years refining the practice and refining what you do need to do. And once you have that guidance and you understand the pieces correctly of the foundation material that we try to show you, the 37 requisites of enlightenment, and you weave them together, you begin to understand he created a system that was a, a training system and a path for you to understand completely the Four Noble Truths, the three characteristics and the human cognition that he put together as dependent origination. So he says, could there be another way to enlightenment at the bottom of, of section 30 when he makes this declaration, but this, uh, this uh, is of no use, he didn't attain any superhuman states, 
So and to any distinction and knowledge of vision worthy of the noble ones, could there be another path to enlightenment? And he thinks for a minute and he recalls something. And that's what's important for us to remember. I considered, I recall when my father, the Sakin, was occupied when he was a child and there was the harvest festival going on. While I was sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree where his nurse left him so she could attend the blessing of the silver blade for the harvest festival in the field, right beside the field, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, and it's like I say, of course, he was secluded from uh, sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. He was a little boy with no past in his head and no future worries. He was clear and pure. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, means thinking and examining thought, vitaka and vichara, okay? With joy and happiness, they say rapture and pleasure. We say joy and happiness, born of seclusion. And happiness in Buddhism is not vibratory happiness. It is an internal contentment. Could that be the path to enlightenment? Then following on that memory came realization. This indeed is the path to enlightenment. So I thought, am I afraid? of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. And I thought to myself, I am not afraid of that pleasure that you experience that is pleasurable uh, in, during your meditation. I'm not afraid of any uh, state that uh, I, uh, of that kind of pleasure since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. He realizes the difference. He realizes you don't have to be afraid of joy if you experience it in your practice. Why would you say, don't get attached to joy? Well, that's true. Don't get attached to joy. <laughs> don't make it stay there because it won't. He told you this, but it didn't say, don't ever feel joy and don't be happy. This is quite ridiculous when even the Dhammapada has a section on we are the happy ones. What does a happy person look like? Ugh. Am I supposed to be like this all day? I'm Buddhist nun. I'm going to teach you the Dharma. Please come, listen to me. I don't think so. I'm delighted with understanding how this works. It set my whole life free. It changed everything I thought about being born and living and dying. It changed everything about where I was personally in my own life in, in this particular time frame, you see. So why in the world would I walk around like a sad sack and not smile? <laughs> it's just silly, okay? You can enjoy life. You can go smell the rose and then go back and tell your husband that you smelled the rose and it's down there on the path. Go look at the new orchid, it just bloomed. It's beautiful. But you don't have to think about it all day long and not function anymore because you can't get it out of your head because a Nietzsche is effective all the time. A Nietzsche is your friend, by the way. You know, without a Nietzsche, you are stuck if you think you have to hang on to all the things that happened to you in the past and drag them around with you. And you think that you have to worry all the time about the future. That's crazy. That's crazy. You don't have to put down the backpack that's the, in, in by the door, hang it on a hook, then reach on the front of yourself and take the day pack, which is the worry about the future, unhook it and put it on the other hook. Now go out for the day and try living in the present time as you go through the day and keep smiling. That's what this was about. Suppose he says, he says, now, I'm not afraid of these pleasures since it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. I considered it's not easy to attain this pleasure um, with a body so excessively emaciated, and so I should eat some solid food. So he goes and he eats solid food. He's talking about now, he's going to get ready. And this is the point. This moment is the point where he breaks off from the five ascetics. He separates himself from them because they will leave him now in the story. They will leave him because he's turned his life 
to pleasure and luxury. He's going to eat and take a bath in the river and get his body full of energy and strength again. And then he's going to go sit under the tree. He doesn't go and sit under the tree at this point. She brings him the rice, milk rice to eat first and nurse helps to get, make sure he has food to come back. He stays where he is. He gets the solid food, washes in the river you figure, and he sleeps properly. And he doesn't deny himself good fresh air and he doesn't deny himself food. And he builds himself back up so he can do this last time and get through. This is what happens, right? And now the at that time in five, because we're waiting upon him thinking if our recluse Gautam achieves a higher state, he will inform us. That's what one of them says. But when I ate the, bo the boiled rice and porridge, then the five bhikkhus were disgusted with him. And they left thinking recluse Gautama now lives in luxuriously and he's given up his striving. He's reverted to luxury, let us leave. And they left him. After all that time, they left him. Now, when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana. With joy and happiness born of seclusion, but such pleasant feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain and get stuck. I passed away. So then with the stilling of this thinking and examining thought, I entered upon and abided in the second John and he gained some confidence and he experienced a deeper joy. And with the fading away of that joy, I entered upon and abided in the third John and he begins to lose the feeling in his body at this time. That's where he lose, begins to lose the feeling of his body. And abandoning this pleasure and pain, both I entered upon abided in the fourth jhana, and that's where he gets a strong feeling of equanimity established. His strong feeling of equanimity is established, and it did not invade him and remain. It did not get stuck, you see. And then what happens? When my concentrated mind was purified, bright, unblemished, and rid in perfections and malleable, wieldy, I could, you know, control this steadiness of my observation. I attained to imperturbability. I was not going to be disturbed anymore. Not anymore. Okay. And I recollected the, that's the time when he recollected all his past lives and he goes through the three knowledges and then the story goes from there. So this is, this is giving you an idea of what he went through. And so when someone says to you as a Buddhist, you know, but what did the Buddha ever struggle with? What did the Buddha suffer? How did he suffer for you? Let me tell you, he really suffered for us. For six years, he suffered for us so that he could come out and go through and experience a clearing, a purification of his mind and opening. And when he was able to do that, then he decides to teach it to others. How does he teach it? He doesn't prophesize or he doesn't, you know, uh, preach, uh, you have to believe me or anything like that. He sets up a system where you're only supposed to believe what you can see for yourself. You're only supposed to practice uh, as closely as, you know, we give you the instructions. And if you stick to just the instructions, we believe we have found the way to repeat what he did. His practice pattern he decided to teach was his own practice pattern. His, pack, packed, his search was to, to find the suffering, discover it, identify it completely, find the cause of it, and uh, be able to talk about it and explain it completely, understand cessation and what that meant, cessation of suffering, and how a person could experience this periodically in life or permanently, depending on how far the person wanted to go with the practice. So is it usable in life? Oh my goodness gracious, it is. 
And the Eightfold Path are the steps, the steps with which he gave you to do this, all aligned with what he just talked about in, and discovers. This Eightfold Path is there, and it's very, very well laid out. Now, what we're going to do next week, I'm not going to go to 113. You can fish around in 113 in section 12. Let me, let me look at that one. Let's see. I th did we do... Mm-hmm. Mm. 13. No, actually, that's okay. You don't need one. 113 was, if you want to know what 113 was, I'm sending you to, to 113 section 12. And if you look on uh, the bottom of page 910 in the book, you're going to see it says 9 through 20, and it's repeating each individual part. Okay, so what you do to get to 12, you, you say this is 9. 9 is the untrue man who is learned. That's 1. Expert and discipline is, is uh, let's, that's, so that's 9. Then 10 is expert and discipline. 11 is preacher in the Dhamma, and 12 is a forest dweller. So you take forest dweller at the top of 911, and then you attach it to I uh, am a one to, to the bottom part of that statement, and you follow through and read that section, you'll understand what it is. He's just saying he was a forest dweller. That's all this is about. But these are the things as they practice now today, the person might be, um, be a, an expert in discipline, a preacher of the Dhamma, a forest dweller, a refuse rag wearer, an alms food eater, a tree root dweller still, a charnel ground dweller, an open air dweller, a continual sitter, an any bed user, a one session eater, and then it explains from there. And we usually, the monastics eat one session a day when we get older, if the doctors demand it, we eat small meals through the day sometimes. But um, overall, the monastic tries to eat their food between 11 and 12 each day. Uh, which is the custom, and you're allowed to eat a small amount in the morning, and then your one meal in the middle of the day, and then maybe you can have soup at night if you're older. And the reason is so you keep your energy up and you can work on things through the day. And the idea is your energy goes to digestion. So if you're having another meal and stopping to prepare the meal and all that stuff, you don't have time to do the things for the Dhamma that you want to do. So that's what's going on with all of this. That's what it's all about. And what we're going to do next week, if you want to tell anybody about it, people don't usually try to do this, but we're going to do 77 in next week. We're going to do that whole sutta. Okay. And that one um, has a lot of detail in it. And if you know people who are interested in the parts of the teaching, it's a good one to come and listen to because it has a section on virtue, a section on knowledge and vision, a section on higher wisdom. Then it has a section on the Four Noble Truths, and these are only one paragraph each, which is nice. Then it has a section on the way to develop wholesome states. And then it, that's, that one is broken down into four pieces, or five pieces, I guess. The uh, four foundations of mindfulness, the four right kinds of striving, the four bases of spiritual power, the five faculties and the five powers. This is giving you the, the whole 37 requisites of enlightenment is the way to develop your wholesome states. And when we train, we teach you these and we start in the retreat. Now, the other thing I was going to tell you is that uh, I'm still in Poland and um, well, they're hunting for the little creature that's causing all the problem inside me. <laughs> you know, they're hunting and hunting and hunting. So now we've done a number of tests and we're still going on to four more tests, two, two more tests this week and waiting for results to August 1st now. 
So next, this next Friday, I'm going to run a retreat online. So if you're interested in doing the retreat online, you need to contact me. All right, contikema2 at gmail.com. You need to contact me if you want to do this. I'm only going to take maybe eight people, and I might even ask Bonte, uh, but I think he'll do it for me, Bonte Tamagavesi. If I get in a trap where I have to go to a test or something that he can interview people yes. one day, you know, yes. but, um, but I'm going to run this retreat from Friday. Uh, that, that would be, uh, let's see, 11... 12, 13, 14, 15th, I guess. The 15th is Friday, I think. 15th. Okay, so it'd be the yes. 15th uh, to the 24th, I guess. Is that about right? Is that right? 15th to the 24th? 24th. Roughly? Okay. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, and so now this will be online and I will have you list, be listening to, to, the, to Bonte's teachings uh, and, uh, you know, maybe one, I'll, I'll figure out which one, which talks I'm going to use for you. The basic training talks for our retreats are pretty organized. And what they cover when you come to the retreat, I'll tell you real quick. You get the instructions the first night. The second night, you get a lecture basically on hindrances by Bonte or by me. Okay. And then uh, this is Bonte Vimla Ramsey talk, okay, or me, okay. Uh, that's, so you have instructions and then you have, um, right, instructions and then hindrances. And then the third one is path. We give you path knowledge and path knowledge is to understand the track of the jhanas, what they were and how it worked and the path he gave us to go down to reach cessation and to experience what, what he was doing, okay? And the next one, it, it's sort of this way, depending on who, and I think in this case, I might be doing two nights on dependent origination. I might not do do the uh, four foundations of mindfulness, I might instead take this day, what two days to work on dependent origination. So you'll be learn do we'll be going over 38, which is Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta, and then we'll do Madhupandika Sutta the next day. Those two will be done, okay? And uh, so that takes you to about six days, I think, right? And then after dependent origination, we teach you what in the world was the Buddha talking about self and no self? <laughs> and so don't be afraid of this because it's really fun to learn the secret behind this. There's, it's always talked about in terms of non-self and self, and it gets people really frightened, you know, of what this means. But there were other words that were used in suttas to talk about this, like identity and non-identity. And then there was one about personality and non-personality. And when you start to look at those and look at what those words actually mean, that is when uh, you begin to understand that this was not something to be frightened of. It was really about taking things personally or taking life less personally in, when you're living, when you, when you see, hear, smell, taste, touch things. And then we'll do the Eightfold Path also in this retreat. So we'll, the one about uh, the, the teaching about the, the, um, the Atta and Anatta is 148. We will do Chichaka Sutta. Okay, and then um, you will learn in that one, the Buddha was giving the, the monks drills to practice. He wasn't just telling them something. They were, and I'll show you where they were questioning him and he was giving them answers and showing them how to fix the problem of, of this Atta and Anatta conundrum and how to handle it. And it's not frightening at all. It's actually a lot of fun you know, to learn how this actually works. And then the end of it, the retreat, we're going to do the Eightfold Path. And when we go through the Eightfold Path, uh, we will learn to, uh, all through this whole retreat, you have learned the 37 requisites of enlightenment. You will understand the Four Noble Truths, the Three Characteristics of Existence, and the, um, and the, um, Good. Right. And the Eightfold Path. <laughs> what did I lose? Oh, dependent origination. There you go. But you're going to learn human cognition. Don't 
run away because I'm going to talk to you about dependent origination. Sit down and listen to how human cognition actually works in your brain and listen to the science when I explain it to you. Uh, then where you can go on the internet to learn how to change a bad habit or a habit of behavior that isn't working for you in life and you want to change it. How do you do that? And this is right in front of us in the Buddha's teaching. And so we're going to show it to you the way he was doing it. And he maybe didn't know he was doing it, but he's the father, literally, of cognitive psychology and how all of this works. And when you see how it works, he was giving you a tool to use in your life, in day-to-day -day life. And not everybody became a monk in the time of the Buddha, you know? So just as I'm gonna give you one final thing before I let you go, I'm gonna give you this one final thing that um, I have found that was written by Charles Swindle, S-W-I-N-D-O-L-L. -L. And I don't know who he is, but I think he's an English writer of some kind. And this is called Attitude. And this is sort of very much like life perspective and the way you look at things. And he wrote this, I think, in the early 1900s. I'm trying to find out when he actually wrote it, but listen carefully. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on my life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a community, a church, a home, a relationship. A remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude that we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the string that we have on our own instrument, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. There you go. Let's close. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this yes, merit yes, that we yes, have acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of yes, merit. May all beings in earth and yes, space, yes. devas and, and nagas of my spirit, spirit our mind. May they all protect the Buddha's dispensation. Protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Sadhu. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>